Hi everyone, welcome to Channel Logics. This is Narsimha Reddy, Kyasaram. Today we are going to continue the session of current Indian economy. So you know that in the last class we have stopped at the part of Finance Commission. I was just trying to give an overview over the Finance Commission. Today I will try to continue from this part. Okay. So if you see this, uh, and you got any doubts, sir, do ping on the chat. We will try to revert back to your doubt also. Right. So when you see this Finance Commission, I told you that uh, there is a difference between 14th Finance Commission and 15th Finance Commission. Right. And when you come to this 15th Finance Commission, very, very important. When you come to this 15th Finance Commission, I told you that uh, the share of state government in central government taxes uh, has been reduced from uh, 42 percentage to 41 percentage. Right? This is the point that we discussed in the last class. Why it is reduced from 42 percentage to 41 percentage? Uh, because uh, the state of Jammu and Kashmir being converted into union territory, that is the reason behind that. Uh, and I told you that uh, this type of division means uh, out of 100 rupees, uh, 59 rupees uh, staying with the central government and 41 rupees going to the state government is called as a vertical devolution of funds. What is it called as a vertical devolution of funds? Now, this 41 rupees which is available to be distributed among the states, uh, there is a criteria for dispersal. What is the criteria for dispersal? If you see that, uh, when you, in the 15th Finance Commission, uh, we said that 45 percent of the funds are given based on the income distance, 15 percent of the funds uh, are given based on the area. Okay. We also said that uh, some, somewhere around 15 uh, percent of the funds uh, is given uh, based, on, based on the demographic performance okay. and some 10 percent of the funds uh, based on the population. Okay. Again, we have got some uh, 2.5 percent. Uh, 2.5 percent of the funds uh, based on the tax effort, uh, tax effort, uh, and one more thing, what is left over is nothing but uh, we have got uh, area, population, forest and ecology. Sorry, so forest and ecology is going to be 15 percent, uh, and uh, this uh, population is going to be 10 percent. Yes, let me put it properly. I'm going to put it here. So we have got parameter. What are the parameters? Income distance is one parameter, right? The second parameter is area, right? The third parameter is nothing but population. The fourth parameter is nothing but we have got a demographic performance. The fifth parameter is nothing but forest and ecology. The sixth parameter is nothing but tax effort. Tax effort. Okay. Now what is the allocation for? Uh, Income distance, 45% uh, of the allocation. Okay. Area is how much? Uh, area is going to be 15% allocation. So if we see that uh, this is the area. This is the area. For area, how much we have allocated? 15%. Okay. When you come to this uh, population, for population, earlier it was uh, somewhere around 15%. Uh, now it's reduced to 12.5%. Okay. And demographic performance, uh, demographic performance again 15 percent. Demographic performance has got uh, from uh, here if you see it is reduced to, uh, this is uh, population is going to be 10 percent uh, and this is going to be 12.5 percent. Uh, forest again 15 percent, uh, this is 2.5 percent. Okay. So if you see that uh, we are trying to divide that uh, 41 percent of the money to be allocated to all the states uh, based on these parameters income distance, area, population, demographic performance, forest and uh, tax effort. Any state which has got a very low per capita income, they will be getting more amount of funds because 45 percent of the funds are based on that. Any state which has got the highest amount of area, they will be getting funds, uh, high amount of funds. For example, Rajasthan will be getting more amount of funds. Any state which has got the highest population, okay, they will be getting more amount of funds. Any state which is contributing for the reduction in the population uh, is going to get a good amount of funds. Any state which has got the highest forest area, that is going to get more amount of funds. Uh, and any state which is very good at collecting the tax is also going to get a good amount of funds. So like that, based on these parameters, we are going to get funds. Uh, and the important, uh, important important issue here was with respect to population. Why was important issue with respect to population? Uh, in 15th Finance Commission, we are considering uh, not 1971 population, but we are considering uh, 
2011 population. Now, 2011 population is putting some states at a disadvantage. This is what we try to tell you, right? Andhra Pradesh, Assam, Telangana, Kerala, Karnataka, the percentage of the populations have decreased. That is the reason they are getting little amount of money compared to other states. This is what we have discussed in the last class. Is that clear? Next one. So, we will see some other things with respect to the current part. So, for for fulfilling the revenue deficit, 17 states are going to get 2.9 lakh crores of rupees. What is the meaning of revenue deficit? Okay. In the budget, we would be discussing a concept. What is the concept that we would be discussing? There is a concept called as a revenue expenditure and revenue receipts. Okay. The difference between the revenue expenditure and revenue receipts is called as what? Revenue deficit. Means what? Uh, the amount of money that the state is getting in the form of taxes and services uh, is actually less than the amount of money that the state is, state is spending. Now, in such cases, uh, it will be difficult for the state to spend that money. Why it is difficult? Because they are getting little amount of revenue. Such states, they have identified some 17 states. Uh, for 17 states, almost they have allocated 2.9 lakh crores of rupees have been allocated for that. Okay. Similarly, if you see that there is something called sector-specific grants. What is this uh, sector-specific grants? There are certain sectors like health, education, infrastructure. For all those eight sectors, uh, government is giving 1.3 lakh crores of rupees. How much central government is already getting? 1.3 lakh crores of rupees. Okay. Similarly, there is something called as uh, state-specific grants. So, certain special states are going to get uh, 49,599 crores of rupees. All these recommendations are... Uh, 2.9 lakh crores of rupees, 1.3 lakh crores of rupees, 14,599 crores of rupees. All these are coming based on the recommendations of which commission? 15th Finance Commission. Now, if you see here, very, very important, very, very important this one. The grants to local bodies. Okay, here one thing will come into picture and very, very important. What is that thing? There is something called as a Panth Panchayat Raj Act. Okay, otherwise you can say that 73rd and 74th Constitution Amendment Act. You know that in 1992, we had this 73rd and 74th Constitution Amendment Act. As per this Constitution Amendment Act, remember that uh, the Panchayatra institutions and urban local bodies are given something called as a constitutional status. Means what? Uh, they are empowered to collect their own tax. But even after more than 25 years of getting constitutional status, almost 30 years, okay, 1992 means almost 30 years, uh, even after 30 years of getting the constitutional status, uh, the panchayats and other urban local bodies, uh, municipalities, they are not able to get the required amount of funds. Now, if they are not having required amount of funds, uh, whose responsibility is this to help them? It is the responsibility of the central government. That is the reason uh, the central government has allocated uh, 4 lakhs 36 thousand crores of rupees. How much it is? Uh, 4 lakhs 36 thousand crores of rupees out of which some 33.33% is given to the urban local bodies 66.66% is given to the rural local bodies that is the reason you can see 2.4 lakh crores of rupees is given to the rural local bodies and 1.2 lakh crores of rupees is given to urban local bodies so they are dividing them in this 66 and 33% ratios very very important 4.36 lakh crores is as per the 15th finance commission for a period of 5 years for all the 28 states that is what we need to understand right next one 70,051 crores of rupees is being given in the form of health grants. What grants and health grants? This is also a very, very important uh, aspect. Okay. So, to better the health conditions all over the country, the central government is given 70,051 crores. Okay. So, these are all with respect to what? Uh, grants given to local bodies, to urban local bodies, rural local bodies and also to health grants. One more very, very important, disaster management fund. You know that uh, any state might come across some sort of disaster. It can be earthquake. It can be, you know, floods or it can be some other man-made disasters also. In such case, uh, the state should have certain amount of funds available with them, uh, okay, to cater to the needs. Now, for that case, what is happening? Uh, they form something called as a state disaster risk management fund. And for this, uh, the central government is giving 75%. Uh, state governments are expected to contribute how much? 25%. But in case of Union Territories and North, uh, Northeastern and Hilly States, 90% uh, by the central government, 10% by the uh, by the respective Northeastern states. So, this question can come directly in the examination. It should be very, very clear. Okay. So, in case of normal states, 75% uh, by the central government, 25% uh, by the state governments. In case of Northeast and Hilly region states, 90% uh, by the central government, 10% uh, by the state governments. So, if we see like that, uh, 
out of this total 1.6 lakh crore which is required for the disaster risk management fund the central government is giving how much 1.2 lakh crores and only 40000 crores is to be contributed by all the states put together so these are the recommendations given by the 15th finance commission remember that uh, these recommendations are going to be valid till 2026 till 2026 right that's the reason this recommendations have got a validity for 3 or 4 years any exam that you are going to write until you get your examination or till you pass an examination until you get a job this are the recommendation that you are supposed to study because next finance commission will be appointed and they will be giving recommendation 2026 until that point of time this recommendation is what you are going to study for any examination it can be cgl it can be ssc it can be state level services it can be anything okay very very important part hi sanjeev next one very very important uh, uh, current aspects with respect to the budget okay Re see this slide very carefully you are going to get good amount of information i am going to give good analysis also on this uh, part okay now when you come to this see a budget at a glance okay now don't worry about the previous things try to observe only the last parts only the last parts you try to observe okay now here we have got uh, receipts here expenditure here this is the receipt this is the expenditure when you come to receipt what is that government is going to get first one is what revenue receipts means money coming into which account uh, revenue account this called as what revenue receipts money coming into capital account this called as what uh, capital receipts money going from the revenue account this called as what uh, revenue expenditure money going from the capital account this called as what uh, capital expenditure okay now first observe this revenue receipts and revenue expenditure what is the revenue receipts value 26 lakh crores approximately what is the value of the capital uh, expenditure 35 lakh crores what is that uh, 35 lakh crores okay you want one video on niti ayog definitely we'll do that uh, raju naik definitely we'll do that okay so if we see here uh, revenue expenditure is 35 lakh crores 35 lakh crores revenue receipts are how much uh, 26 lakh crores what is the difference uh? what is the difference uh? almost 9 lakh crores that is nothing but it's called as a revenue deficit what is it called as a revenue deficit means uh, this much amount of money is very less in the revenue account is less in the revenue account means uh, you are spending 35 lakh crores but what you are getting is only 26 lakh crores got it so that is a revenue deficit now when you come to capital receipts what is the value of capital receipts 18 lakh crores what is the value of the capital expenditure 10 lakh crores now what it looks it looks very good right capital receipts are more than capital more than capital expenditure that is not the case here out of this 18 lakh crores out of this 18 lakh crores remember that uh, more than 15 lakh crores we are borrowing we are taking loans so if you put that loans aside what you are going to get is only 2 or 3 lakh crores means your expenditure is 10 lakh crores you are getting only 12 or 3 lakh crores your difference is how much 8 lakh crores so capital receipts is also 8 lakh crores okay so this is what you need to understand from this uh, slide it's a very very important slide very very important slide okay believe me okay based on this we are going to have next discussion what is that uh, see here every information is put in a one more way revenue receipts how much uh, 26 lakh crores capital receipts how much uh, 18 lakh crores okay what is the total receipts uh, sum of these both 45 lakh crores okay come into uh, expenditure total expenditure is how much again 45 lakh crores means both of them are equal or not they are equal but uh, out of this 18 lakh crores how much we are getting in the form of loans uh, somewhere around uh, we are getting somewhere around how much i said 15 to 16 lakh crores we are getting in the form of uh, loan remember that uh, 15 lakh crores we are getting in the form of uh, loan remember this okay now revenue deficit i told you what is the revenue deficit uh, revenue expenditure minus revenue receipts uh, what is the revenue receipts uh, 26 lakh crores what is the revenue expenditure i told you just now right in the previous slide we have seen what is the revenue expenditure uh, the revenue expenditure is nothing but uh, 35 lakh crores so 26 lakh crores 35 lakh crores what is the difference if you see the difference is nothing but 8 lakhs uh, 69000 i roughly told you 9 lakhs uh, is nothing but 8 lakhs uh, 69000 crores this is called as what revenue deficit okay similarly what is the meaning of effective revenue deficit what is the meaning of effective revenue deficit now just observe very clearly what is the revenue expenditure revenue expenditure is nothing but you have seen here right what is the revenue expenditure uh, 35 lakh crores okay very carefully observe this concept is very very important this concept is very very important okay 
so clearly observed very nicely i am going to give you very detailedly what is the revenue expenditure revenue expenditure is nothing but 35 lakh 2136 crores okay now what is the effective revenue deficit is mentioned effective revenue deficit 4 lakhs 99000 i am putting roughly as 5 lakhs i am putting roughly as how much 5 lakhs 5 lakhs crores is a effective revenue deficit effective revenue deficit remember that effective revenue deficit is nothing but effective revenue deficit is nothing but revenue deficit minus grants to local bodies grants to local bodies for capital expenditure capex what is that called as a capex capital expenditure okay now see here what is the effective revenue deficit of 4 lakhs 99,000? What is the revenue deficit? 6 lakhs, 8 lakhs, 69,000. So now so, do it here very simply. 8 lakhs, 69,000. 8 lakhs, 69,000. 855 minus uh, roughly I am putting it as 5 lakhs. What is the difference that you are getting? Uh, 3 lakhs, uh, 69,000 crores. Yes. Now this 3 lakhs, 69,000 crores is nothing but uh, it is a grant to the states for capital expenditure. Okay. I am going to explain you this in a very simple fashion. Just observe nicely. Okay. What is that? For example, let us say our parents will be doing a lot of expenditure, right? One of that expenditure is nothing but let us say pocket money is one expenditure. Okay. Let us say that uh, our parents are giving us 10,000 rupees pocket money every month. Now pocket money is the revenue expenditure or capital expenditure. It is a revenue expenditure. Why? Any expenditure that is not going to generate any revenue in the future is called as revenue expenditure. So pocket money is not going to generate any revenue for your dad. So it is a revenue expenditure for your father. He gave you 10,000 rupees. Now what you did? Uh, out of this 10,000 rupees, uh, 8,000 you spent on your expenses. 2,000 you invest in the mutual funds. You invest in what funds? Uh, mutual funds. Yes or no? Means what out of 10,000, 8,000 went off like anything without any, any future requirement, without any expectation in the future. But 2,000 is going to give you revenue in future. So out of this 10,000, 8,000 is the real revenue expenditure, but 2,000 is nothing but capital expenditure. For your dad, 10,000 is revenue expenditure. Okay. But for you, only 8,000 is revenue expenditure. Remain that 2,000 is there now. That is called as a capital expenditure. Similarly here also. What central government is like your dad? For central government, 8 lakhs 69,000 is nothing but revenue deficit. Okay. But for you, only 5 lakhs is revenue deficit. Why? Because remaining 3 lakhs 69,000, you are spending it for something good. For something good. So that deficit is called as effective revenue deficit. You will understand this when we discuss about the topic of budget in detail with the along with the complete flow. Okay. Fiscal deficit. Total expenditure of the government and uh, total revenue of the government when you do a, a subtraction what you get is nothing but fiscal deficit uh, 17 lakh crores means what uh, government is running short of 17 lakh crores uh, government is spending this 17 lakh crores by borrowing money from the market okay and primary deficit is nothing but uh, if you are not having any requirements of payment of interest uh, okay then that remaining is called as a primary deficit means what uh, fiscal deficit minus uh, interest payments Means how much is the interest payments that you have? Uh, 17 lakhs minus 10 lakhs, 10 lakh crores. Means uh, you are paying 10 lakh crores as interest uh, out of the 17 lakh crores. Uh, so this 10 lakh crores is nothing but uh, interest payments. Uh, difference is nothing but 7 lakh crores. Uh, that 7 lakh crores is nothing but uh, primary deficit. Okay. So this is with respect to statistics, uh, recent statistics that you should have with you. Okay. Next one. See here. This is also very, very important statistics. Fiscal deficit. What is the fiscal deficit for the upcoming year? 5.9%. How much it is? 5.9%. Okay. Means what? Uh, in the GDP, out of our GDP, next year, 5.9% of the GDP, whatever is the value that we are going to get, uh, so much amount of money we are having less with us. Means we need to borrow this money from a uh, market. And when you come to second one, what is the second one? Revenue deficit, 2.9%. Means what? Uh, in the revenue account, uh, revenue expenditure is more than revenue receipts by 2.9% of GDP. Okay. The third one, what is the third one? Primary deficit, 2.3%. Why primary deficit reduced? Uh, out of 5.9%, uh, remaining what is the difference is there? Uh, that is nothing but interest payments. So if you remove the interest payments, what you are going to get is nothing but 2.3% of the GDP. Okay. Last one is the effective revenue deficit. 
In 2.9 percent, what do we say? Revenue deficit. If you remove the money that you are giving to states for capital expenditure, if you remove that money, whatever is left over is nothing but only 1.8 percent. Okay. So these are with respect to the statistics that we have here. Okay. Nah? So what is the next year's expected fiscal deficit? 5.9 percent of GDP. This is the numbers you should have in your in your mouth. Okay. And what is the Revenue deficit that you are expecting next year is 2.9 percent of GDP. What is the primary deficit that you are expecting is 2.3 percent of GDP. And what is the effective revenue deficit that you are expecting is only 1.7 percent of GDP. Okay. So these are the important statistics with respect to budget. Now see here, very very important with respect to poverty. Okay. In the economy course, we have discussed in detail what are the types of poverty, what are the communities appointed for poverty. Here we are trying to see what are the recent statistics with respect to poverty is concerned. Okay. Some statistics that you should make a note in your uh, uh, what is it called in your book, you should make a note because this will come directly in the examinations. Okay. Now if you see that uh, it is observed, it is observed by multidimensional poverty index, which is given by, okay, which is published by UNDP, multidimensional poverty index. What it is saying, 22.8 uh, crore Indians are under poverty. So how many Indians are under poverty? 22.8 crore Indians are under poverty. This is what it is saying, okay. Very, very important, okay. And this is the highest amount of poor in the world. So India is having highest population of poverty people in the world. First important thing. And this is a very recent report that is re released, okay. And what it is saying, uh, f in the last 15 years, 41.5 uh, crore people have escaped from poverty. Means they rose from under poverty to above poverty line. They came above the poverty line. How much people? 41.5 uh, crore people have come above poverty line in the last uh, 15 years. This is a very recent report given by Multidimensional Poverty Index by UNDP, okay. And one more important thing is that, uh, between 2005 to 2019-20, okay, means almost in this last 15 years, uh, the poverty ratio has decreased from 55.1 percentage to 16.4 percent. So that is the reason uh, we have lifted how much of uh, 41.5 crore people from poverty. So with respect to ratio, if you observe, 55.1 uh, percent of the people were below poverty line in 2005-2006. Uh, now we have got only 16.4 percent of the people below poverty line. So this is also one more observation you should make a note, okay. So three things are very important here, 22.8 crore people have, are under poverty in India. In the last 15 years, 41.5 crore people have been lifted out of poverty, okay. And the poverty ratio has reduced from 55.1 to 16.4. So these are the important observations in the recent times. Next one, sorry. Next one. And uh, if you see that 16.4 percent of the people, 16.4 percent of the people are considered to be in the poor and 4.2 percent are under very severe poor, means uh, they are considered to be extremely poor, extremely poor. And there is a threat for 18.75 percent to come under poverty, means they may soon be under poverty. If you do not take proper measures, they will be under poverty. So this is also one important observation, okay. And, uh, Apart from this, if we see, observe, these are some important things. Goa is expected to be the fastest relative poverty reduction among all the Indian states. So, what is the meaning of relative poverty? What is the meaning of relative poverty? Let us understand this term, okay. So, relative poverty is nothing but, good evening indeed. Relative poverty is nothing but, uh, you are trying to compare the topmost person of the people with the bottommost section of the people. When you see the difference in their poverty level, there is a high difference. That is called as what? Relative poverty. So, relative poverty is nothing but comparing the top 10 percent of the people with the bottom 10 percent of the people. The difference in the standard of living is called as relative poverty. Okay. For example, let us say that you are going on a road with a new, uh, what is that called as a Royal Enfield bike. New Royal Enfield bike you have taken. Okay, you did, you did a puja for it and uh, you are going on a road, okay, nicely driving on a empty road early morning, okay, nice breeze, everything, okay. Suddenly you are enjoying a very great moment. Suddenly what happened, uh, a, a film star, a Bollywood star came beside you and he went in, a, went in his Ferrari car. Until now you felt very good about yourself, while when you saw that fellow going on Ferrari car very fast uh, with uh, open top and all those things, uh, then you felt very bad because when you compared with them, you understood that you are still poor. That's called as what relative poverty. Remember that uh, relative poverty is a concept uh, which is being observed in the developed countries. But in countries like India, above, apart from relative poverty, we also see absolute poverty. Okay. So we are basically concentrating on absolute poverty. So that's a very, very important uh, aspect. 
Then if you see that uh, with respect to multidimensional poverty index also, which is given recently by Niti Aayog, okay, what it says is that uh, India's uh, multidimensional poverty index score is 0 0.1, 0 0.118, okay, with uh, urban areas uh, scoring 0 0.08 less uh, and uh, rural areas is 0 0.155, okay. So don't worry about that. One important thing that you should note, very, very important thing is nothing but Kerala has turned out to be the state with the lowest rate of uh, poverty. This uh, one make a note in your uh, book, okay. Least poverty state in the country, Kerala. Which state is decreasing its relative poverty drastically, Goa. Least poverty state in the country is Kerala. And which state is decreasing its poverty level drastically is nothing but Goa. Very, very important. One more important thing that you should note here is that uh, there is a district in Kerala called Kottayam. Kottayam is the only district which is not having any poverty, poverty free district in the country, Kottayam of Kerala. So yeah, when something is coming very new, you should, better, you should make a note of all these things. So Kottayam is the uh, district in Kerala which is completely poverty free, poverty free. And when you come to the states, uh, the most state with, uh, state with highest number of highest amount of poverty, Bihar. State with the highest amount of poverty, Bihar, followed by Bihar is Jharkhand and Uttar Pradesh. So Bihar is coming in news for many things, sir. Bihar is a state which has got the highest density of population in the country. Bihar is also a state with the highest percentage of poverty. So what are the poverty ratios in in Bihar? 51.91 percent. What is the ratio of poverty? 50 means sir, more than 50 percent of the people in Bihar are under poverty. More than 50 percent of the people in Bihar are under poverty. So these are the important observations that we have. Once again, I'll just tell you about the poverty observations, sir. First and foremost thing you should know that 22.8 crore people are under poverty in India. In the last 15 years, sir, we have removed or we have elevated 41.5 crore people out of poverty. That's the second important observation that we should make a note of it, okay. And the state which is reducing, is reducing its relative poverty drastically is nothing but Goa. Okay, and uh, the state which has got highest poverty is nothing but Bihar. Okay, and the state which has got the least poverty is nothing but Kerala. The district in the country which is having a zero poverty is nothing but Kottayam district. So, these are the important points that will directly come in the examination, sir. So, these are the current points that we are going to we are speaking about. Okay, make a note of this. Okay. Uh, Telugu lo chappali, but it is an English channel. Uh, we will discuss the same things in Telugu channel also. Okay. Yeah. So, Vivanta Gudanga Intendiyamma is all about uh, Pedrika Munch Madarathan, statistics, okay. Unemployment rate, Nirudhyogita. So, when you come to unemployment rate, what exactly is unemployment rate? Means a person aged between 15 to 60 years of age, physically, mentally fit, but willing to do work, unable to find work. Such person is to be under poverty, okay. Now, if we see recent statistics, uh, the poverty rate in India is nothing but 7.6 percent in April, June 2022. So in April, June quarter what they found is that uh, the unemployment rate in India is almost 7.6 percent of the people. Means uh, out of the total labor force available in the country, out of the total labor force available in the country, how many people are actually not getting work? Means 7.6 percent of the people are not actually getting, they are not actually not getting work. So the reason unemployment rate is nothing but 7.6 percent. One more important thing I will tell you, see here. Uh, Highest unemployment state in the country, Kerala. Okay. 2013 14 was 9.3, 2015 16 is 10.6. Because 2015 16 is the time period when they did last time a complete survey. Okay. Kerala has got 10.6 percent unemployment rate. Now, you see that why Kerala is having highest percent of unemployment. Okay. Kerala has got a typical different scenarios. What is the typical different scenario? In Kerala, when you see, in Kerala, when you observe, okay. People are either willing to get a government job within the state or they'll be willing to go abroad. Now, every family, in every family in Kerala, at least one person will be working in other countries. At least one person will be working in other countries, okay? Now, when a person is working in other countries, uh, the one who is working in other country, what he will do, he will tell to his family members, okay, don't do all small, small jobs. Uh, you prepare or you try to get skills uh, which are required to find a job in other countries. That's how you will ask him to keep quiet and uh, get skills rather than working in a small, small jobs. That is the reason unemployment rate in poverty is very, unemployment rate in Kerala is very, very high. So that is one reason. And the state with the least unemployment rate, Gujarat, uh, Gujarat 0.6% unemployment rate. These are the two important indicators that you know. 
highest unemployment state is Kerala among the normal states, okay. And the least unemployment rate is nothing but Gujarat, very, very important. So, these are recent uh, things that is coming from uh, Center for Monetary Indian Economy. Yes, <coughs> observe this slide, very, very nice uh, uh, chart it is going to give you. Okay, there is something called as uh, F I I and D I I. Foreign institution investments, domestic institution investments. What is the meaning of foreign institution investments? Foreign institution investments are those investments coming from the foreign countries. Ante. Those investments which are coming from other countries is called as foreign institution investments. And those investments which are coming from within the country is called as domestic institution investments. Now, if you observe, the red color is nothing but foreign institution investments. The black color is nothing but domestic institution investments. Okay. Now, what is the meaning of foreign institution investments? Uh, any investments coming from other countries into stock market of the country is called as foreign institution. Means they come and invest where not in a setting up companies. They invest in the stock market of the country. That's called foreign institutional investments. Okay. Now, remember that uh, whenever foreigners is coming and investing in the stock market of India, whenever this is small difference, disturbance, what they'll do? They'll take away their investments. That is the reason if you observe, uh, March 2020, what is the time period? Uh, there is a time period of COVID. So in COVID, if you see that uh, foreign institution investments have become negative, they have come down drastically. Why? Because people are not having confidence in the country, they are not, they are taking away their investments. Okay. When the COVID thing becomes again normal, again their investments have increased. Again some problem. Now we are having uh, some recession type of problem. So again investments have decreased. Okay. Whenever foreign institution investments decreased, who is uh, supporting us? Uh, domestic institution investments are uh, supporting us. This is what you can understand from this uh, graph. Okay. So, red color is foreign institution investments uh, and black color is nothing but domestic institutional investments. Clear? Yes. Yes, we'll do that, Chidambaram. Okay. Next. Very, very important. Uh, from now on, if Telugu medium or English medium doesn't make much difference. Because we are going to see about the uh, institutions. Institutions, what we are going to see? We are going to see the recent appointments. Okay, what are recent updates each, with each and every institution? There is nothing like concept wise. Okay, so it will be easy for everyone of you to understand. First and the foremost, India International Exchange it is the only international stock exchange in the country. Only international stock exchange in the country is nothing but India International Exchange. Okay, now I discussed this in the economy class also. Okay. Now, this is a subsidiary of Bombay Stock Exchange. Who is the owner of this uh, Bombay Stock Exchange? Where is it located? Uh, International Financial Services Center. International Financial Services Center. Okay, International Financial Services Center. Where is it present? Uh, gift City of Gandhinagar. What is the full form of gift? Uh, Gujarat International Financial Technology City. Gujarat International Financial Technology City. So in Gift City of Gandhinagar, we have got only international stock exchange in the country. That's called as a India International Exchange. Okay. Now when you come to this, uh, one important observation is that recently there is a change in the MD and CEO. And the current MD and CEO is none other than Mr. Sudarshanam Srinivasan. Who is that? Sudarshanam Srinivasan. Make a note of this point. Recent change happened. So this is important. Sudarshanam Srinivasan is the MD and CEO of this uh, India International Exchange. Okay, where is the headquarters? Uh, Gift City of Gandhi Nagar in Gujarat. Okay, now, when was it established? 2017. It's the only international stock exchange in the country. Next, one more important stock exchange, that is Bombay Stock Exchange. Very, very important. Okay, Bombay Stock Exchange established in 1875. It's the oldest stock exchange not only in India but also Asia. Means, uh, not only in India, in complete Asia, it's the oldest stock exchange. Bombay Stock Exchange. Okay. Yes, uh, I'll tell you whenever required, I'll also tell you about the tricks and day. Sir, do the videos on Nithi Definitely I'll do Mamata on Nithi also. See, there are some places where you need to have tricks. Too much of tricks is also dangerous. For example, uh, I'll be dealing with something like, you know, uh, national parks topic as a part of GK. There I'll give you tricks. I'll deal with something called as a currencies. There I'll give you tricks. Okay, so some only in certain topics tricks are good. If you make these tricks too much, uh, there will be difficulty in remembering the tricks also again. Okay, I'll give whenever and where required. Okay, so these appointments and these things, uh, you should come across them regularly, you'll remember them. Okay, now Bombay Stock Exchange is the oldest stock exchange not only in India but also complete Asia. It's the oldest stock exchange established in 1875. 
and where is the headquarters uh, bombay or mumbai is a headquarters and very very important ss mundra very recent appointment ss mundra recently appointed as the chairman and uh, Sundar Raman Ramurthy got appointed as a MD and CEO. Right in your book, very very important. S S Mundra is the chairman of Bombay Stock Exchange. Sundar Raman Ramurthy is the MD and CEO of Bombay Stock Exchange. Earlier we have got Ashish Kumar Chauhan, but that Ashish Kumar Chauhan became the MD and CEO of National Stock Exchange that we are going to see next. Okay. So as this position became vacant in this place, who who came? Sundar Raman Ramurthy became the MD and CEO. So this is one thing that you should remember, okay? And uh, this is very very important. Sensex, the index of BS is called as Sensex. You know that you all see something called Nifty Sensex every time it comes in the newspaper, in the news channels everywhere, right? What exactly is that? It is nothing but uh, to keep people informed about the average, to keep people informed about the average, uh, or you can say like uh, uh, overall overall uh, changes in the stock market, okay? See, I cannot go and uh, study each and every stock in the stock exchange. There are some thousands of stocks, right? For me, I wanted to know overall is the stock market good or bad. How do I know? For that, I need an indicator, and that indicator is nothing but Sensex, where in Bombay Stock Exchange. Same thing if I go for National Stock Exchange. It's not Bombay Stock Exchange. It's basically National Stock Exchange. Okay? When you go to National Stock Exchange, it's called as Nifty. What is it called as Nifty? Here we have got 50 stocks. Here we have got. Uh, 30 stocks. Logic is the same. Logic is the same. Only the number of stocks uh, vary. Here we have got 30 stocks. Uh, here we have got uh, 50 stocks. Okay. So this is as simple as that. I'll tell you. For example, uh, now in uh, Chandan Logics we have got students from different different streams. Let's say we have got SSC students. We have got banking students. Uh, we have got RRB students. Uh, we have got some uh, defense preparation students. Uh, we have got some state public service commission students. Uh, all the students, right? Now, I wanted to see the performance of all the students, okay. Now, if I have to conduct an exam for each and every student uh, at together, there are some lakhs of students, uh, I will find it very difficult to conduct and also evaluate the papers, okay. So, what I will do simply, I pick up few students from banking, I pick up few students from SSE, I pick up few students from RRB, I pick up few students from state public solution, I will conduct an exam, let's say. Uh, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, I'll take some 100 students, I'll conduct examination. I'll get certain amount of marks, I'll calculate the average, okay. I'll give them one more week time. Again, I'll conduct examination, okay. Now, again, I'll take the 100 papers, I'll evaluate, I'll get the average marks. I'll compare this average mark with last, last week average marks. If there's increase, I'll tell that, yes, my students are studying good. There is improvement in their uh, studies. Like that uh, is nothing but nifty or sensex. So, in uh, thousands of stocks available in the stock market, I am picking up only 50 stocks. I am trying to see what is the improvement of these 50 stocks uh, in their valuation from day after day. That is nothing but nifty, as simple as that. Nothing big in this. Okay? These things are detailedly discussed in the course. Okay? Now, it came to establishment in 1992. It started operation in 1994. Very, very important. Uh, Girish Chandra Chaturvedi is the chairman. Girish Chandra Chaturvedi is the chairman. And who is MD and CEO? Ashish Kumar Chauhan. Ashish Kumar Chauhan is the MD and CEO of National Stock Exchange. So these are the two important things. So is this clear for everyone of you? Any doubts, you just ask me, okay? Clear? Okay. So National Stock Exchange, 1992, operation from 1994, and headquarters Mumbai, and chairman is Grish Chandra Chaturvedi, and MD and CEO is Ashish Kumar Chauhan. And what is the index? Nifty. I told you, Ashish Kumar Chauhan was earlier the MD and CEO of Bombay Stock Exchange. Now, who is MD and CEO of Bombay Stock Exchange? Ramurthy is MD and CEO of Bombay Stock Exchange. Okay? Remember these three. So, I discussed three stock exchanges. One is India International Exchange. The other one is nothing but Bombay Stock Exchange. The other one is nothing but National Stock Exchange. Clear? Next one. Very, very important, uh, World Bank. Okay? So, when you come to this World Bank, what are the important things that you should know? First and foremost important thing, World Bank came into establishment in which year? 1944. When World Bank came into establishment, 1944, very, very important. How many countries are members of World Bank? 189 countries are members of World Bank. How many countries? 189 countries. Which is the 189th country? Nauru. Which is the 189th country? Nauru. Nauru is the 189th country that became member of World Bank. Okay. Now, next question. Where is the headquarters of World Bank? Remember that it can be World Bank or it can be IMF. The headquarters are present in, the both headquarters are present in Washington, D.C. 
okay, World Bank and IMF, uh, both the headquarters are present in Washington, D.C. This is one important thing that you should be remembering, okay. And one more important thing with respect to World Bank, who is the president of World Bank? Remember that uh, the current president of World Bank is David Malpass. He recently offered to resign. In place of David Malpass, uh, Ajay Banga might become the president of World Bank. Uh, this is a current affairs uh, because he is nominated by United States of America. Remember that. Uh, United States of America has got the highest stake in World Bank. Whoever USA nominates, that person will definitely become the World Bank president. So, our uh, Ajay Banga might become the World Bank president. So, he is from India, he is from Hyderabad. He is the alumni of Hyderabad Public School, Ajay Banga. So, he might become the president of World Bank soon. That will come to know by next uh, month. So, this is a very, very important uh, aspect. Okay? Yes. And uh, one more important thing I wanted to bring before you, very important current affairs, uh, Indermit Gill. Who is this Indermit Gill? Indermit Gill is none other than, he uh, is a chief economist of World Bank. He is a chief economist of uh, World Bank. So Indermit Gill is a chief economist of World Bank. Uh, this is also one important point that you should make a note of because he is a second person from India to become the chief economist of World Bank. Earlier we had Kaushik Basu, now we have Indermit Gill. So, very, 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 very important. Very, very important in the myth, uh, Gil. Okay? Next one. <clears throat> IMF, International Monetary Fund. Okay? One more important thing I will tell you in World Bank. Okay? Now, there are some divisions in World Bank. What are the divisions in World Bank? First one is nothing but IBRD, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. The second one is nothing but International Finance Corporation. The third one is nothing but International Development Association. Okay. The fourth one is nothing but International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. And the fifth one is nothing but a Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency. All these together would make as what? A World Bank Group. So when I say World Bank, it's not one or two. It is a group of these five divisions. What are the five divisions? Uh, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. International Bank, sorry. International Bank for Reconstruction and Development is first one, okay. Second one is the International Finance Corporation. The third one is International Development Association. The fourth one is International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. And the fifth one is the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency. All these five together would make up something called as a World Bank Group. Very, very important part, okay. Yes. <laughs> Next one. IMF, International Monetary Fund. Very, 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 very important. When you come to International Monetary Fund, uh, both uh, World Bank and IMF, both of them are called as the Bretton Woods Twins. What are they called as? Uh, Bretton Woods uh, Twins. Why are they called as the Bretton Woods Twins? Uh, they are called as Bretton Woods Twins uh, because uh, both of them were formed in the same meeting called as the Bretton Woods Conference. So they are called as what? Bretton Woods uh, Twins. Okay. Now, when you come to this IMF, uh, it is also, the decision was taken in 1944, but it came into existence in 1945. All the countries which are members of World Bank are also members of IMF except one more country added that is called as Andorra or Principality of Andorra. Make a note of this point, okay. Principality of Andorra is the 190th country that became part of World Bank. It is the 190th country that became part of World Bank. What is that? Principality of Andorra. Principality of Andorra. This is a very, very important one. So, 189 in World Bank, 190 in IMF. Okay. One more important thing is nothing but CMD. Crystalina Georgievia, who is the Chief Managing Director of IMF. Crystalina Georgievia is the Chief Managing Director of IMF. Very, very important. The Deputy Managing Director of IMF is none other than Indian Geeta Gopinath. So, make a note of this. Geeta Gopinath. It's not written here. Make a note of this. Geeta Gopinath is the Deputy Managing Director of IMF. Geeta Gopinath is a Deputy Managing Director of IMF. So, the Chief Managing Director is uh, Kristalina Georgievia and Deputy Managing Director is Geeta Gopinath. In World Bank, the President is David Malpass, uh, the Chief Economist is Indermit Gill. Here, one Indian, there also one Indian, both two Indians you should remember. Okay? And whatever the help that is required, it is given in the form of SDRs. So, whenever a country faces uh, something called as economic crisis or a financial crisis, then when you go to IMF, they'll give you help. And the help will be in the form of what? 
SDRs. SDRs means what? Uh, special drawing rights. What is it called as? Uh, special drawing rights. In the form of SDRs, they will be giving help. That is also very, very important uh, part. Okay. In your know, prime packages. And uh, one more important thing, see here. Uh, India quota of SDRs, 2.75%. Means, for example, let us say there is a 100 rupees. Out of 100 rupees, 2 rupees 75 paisa is the quota for India. Whenever there is election, uh, India will have a voting rights and the value of India's vote is nothing but 2.63. So, out of the total 100 uh, percentage of votes available, 2.63 percent votes uh, are the value of India's votes. So, these two are important because recent times it has increased. Some 0.3 percent increase for India. So, since increase for India means what? Uh, India's influence in the international, uh, international uh, uh, level is increasing. That's what you need to understand. Okay. So, once again, uh, International Monetary Fund uh, established in 1945. Okay. Headquarters, Washington, D.C. Okay. And members, 190 countries and 190th countries, nothing but principality of uh, Andorra. And uh, CMD is Krishna and Georgie Bia. And uh, deputy managing director is Geeta Gopinath. And uh, the help comes in the form of SDRs. SDR stands for full form is asked many times in the examination. Special drawing rights. What is the full form of SDR? Special drawing uh, rights. And what is India's quota? 2.75. What are India's voting rates? 2.63%. So these are very, very important with respect to what? With respect to <coughs> something called as uh, SDRs and International Monetary Fund. Okay. So this is all with respect to this. And once again, I'm just revising what we have discussed. Uh, so in today's class, we started our discussion with something called as uh, Finance Commission. So I completed whatever is left in the last class in the Finance Commission. And then I came to something called as budget. I discussed the budget uh, statistics at a glance. Uh, what are revenue receipts? What are capital receipts? What is the revenue expenditure? What is the capital expenditure? And then we went on discussing about what is the meaning of uh, effective revenue deficit, fiscal deficit, primary deficit. Okay. Then we discussed uh, something called as a trade deficit also. We discussed something called as a trade deficit. Okay. And uh, uh, what is the fiscal deficit percentage? What is the uh, revenue deficit? What is the effective revenue deficit? What is the primary deficit? In percentage of GDP also we have discussed. discussed. Okay. We discussed as what is poverty, what is the status of poverty in India as on date. Okay. Recent statistics of Niti Aayog 2, 2, 2023 index I have taken. Okay. I discussed all those things. I told Bihar is the poorest state. Kerala, in Kerala, Kotaim is the poverty free country in the uh, in the entire in the entire and uh, poor, uh, Kerala has got these poverty levels. Okay, all these things we have discussed. Unemployment rate that we have discussed. Okay, Kerala is the highest unemployment rate. Okay, and then we discussed about uh, foreign direct investment and domestic institution investments, foreign institution investments, how they are moving. Okay, then we discussed about India International Exchange. Okay, the only international stock exchange present in the country. We discussed about uh, Bombay Stock Exchange. We discussed about National Stock Exchange. Then we went on something called as a World Bank. And finally, we discuss something called as uh, IMF. So, whatever the data that I'm giving before you, it's a very much current data. So, this data is going to help you in the examinations. Understand? So, this is what for today. I'll just uh, end for today. We'll continue the session again in one more class. Thank you, everyone.